Hi, everybody. Welcome. I am so excited to have a very, very distinguished and well-known guest with me, Dr. Don Shum, uh, who has been uh, what I consider a pillar of the community in hearing healthcare for many years now. And I know I'm not alone in saying that, Don. So I definitely want to thank you for all that you have done. I think that you've been uh, an inspiration to many uh, throughout your career. So, you know, kudos to you for, for doing amazing stuff for the field. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. I yeah. Appreciate I, and so I know uh, we've, we've crossed paths, uh, although we've never really had a formal introduction. Uh, I know we, we, we got really close at a bar one time uh, at an Oticon event <laughs> and I wanted to make my way over, but I also didn't want to interrupt you. Uh, so tell me a little bit you know, people, I, I know people have been following your career for a long time. And I guess what I would love to know is, is the why behind it. What's your motivation in everything you've done? Um, that's a very good question. And, 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 and at this point in a career, I suppose it's a legitimate question to, to kind of reel it back and say, you know, how did I get started in here? And yeah. Basically, how I got started when I was uh, when I was working on my master's degree, uh, I was at the University of Iowa. I had a uh, uh, my my advisor, my faculty advisor, was a gentleman named uh, Dr. David Hawkins, who you know very well known in the field. Yes, absolutely. Um, and he was a uh, a hearing aid person, and um, it just uh, it, it, I just became very interested in that part of the field. Um, be, because whatever, it, it just seemed that there's a lot of interesting questions. I enjoyed his coursework and, and I enjoyed working with him as a, as a student researcher and things like that. And so that just got me into the hearing aid side of things. Okay. Um, so when I started, when I was working on my PhD uh, and eventually I was down at uh, Louisiana State University, I also had, uh, I had a very good mentor at the time, uh, Dr. Jane Collins, but, I, but our department head at the time uh, was... Um, 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 was a, was a, uh, had a big focus on speech science. And okay. so a guy named, uh, the late Ray Daniloff and, and he, he taught me a lot about speech as a, as a, as a signal. And, and it just become, it became very interesting for me to meld those two together is to say that a lot of times in audiology, we, 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 we think we know what the speech signal is all about. But as you study it kind of from the speech science side, you learn right. a lot more about the speech signal and all that. And then finally, when I, was, when I was working in my first job as a researcher, I was at Medical University of South Carolina, right. uh, working on a, a large NIH aging project that is still in existence um, mm -hmm. and going on strong. Um, and I became very interested in the cognitive side of processing because of the aging issue. So back in, the, so this is in the late 80s, where um, before it became sexy to talk about aging, <laughs> cognitive yeah. decline and all that, um, I was able to tap into a lot of literature talking about cognitive models of perception and things like that. And so all three just came together. And, uh, and I worked for uh, about five years back in Iowa at the uh, medical university in the, in the ENT department running the hearing aid lab. Um, so everything sort of came together at that point in time. And then when I had the opportunity to join industry, I did. Uh, to bring sort of that viewpoint as a clinician and as a teacher and as a researcher and bring it all into the hearing aid manufacturing side. And so I've been, well, I've been, that's a, I mean, that's a great story. I am, I, I definitely, you know, I see you in a different light now because, you know, you can read these things about Don Shum all over the internet, but to really hear how you go from, and look, if I have my way, and I'm sure you would agree. I would love if every audiologist really took the time to understand the speech signal, to understand the science behind communication, speech, how it's processed. And then, like you said, I mean, the brain just, you know, I, I not in the 80s, maybe not even in the 90s, but in the early 2000s, I just felt like I'm seeing patients and how is it that I seem to have this percent of patients that seems higher than the average population that there's cognitive issues going on here? And yes, you're right. It's definitely become sexy. Although, I mean, Dr. Lin's research has been out for a decade now. It should have been sexy the day after, but it's taken a while. We're a little slow to uptake in our field. I'm sure you've you've witnessed that. At times, yes. It, it feels, <laughs> yes. 
Yeah. Um, so that's, I mean, that's a great story. And I love that. I think every PhD researcher I've ever met can always go back to that one teacher, right? Mm-hmm. Who, who sort of motivated them to ask more questions. Uh, yep. Mine at Brooklyn College was Dr. Rubenstein. And then I was lucky enough to work with Dr. Liberman at Mass Eye and Ear for, for a decade, uh, studying how not only the ear impacts the brain, but you know, going backwards, how the brain can control and modulate activity in the cochlea. So what a great story. And I, I had a feeling we would share some of those uh, research commonalities. Um, now, look, us uh, uh, PhDs, right, the research people, sometimes we, we get knocked uh, when we step into industry. What was that like for you? It was a time where um, there weren't a lot of us in there. There were a few pioneers who had come in a little bit earlier, Mm -hmm. people like Powers and and, and a few other people like that. Um, But it was still it was still sort of like, is this a right career move? Can I ever go back? Will I be welcomed back? Yeah, right. Will you be shunned forever? I, I I sort of got over that pretty quickly. You know, it's like, you know, life will take you where it takes you. Um, and so it was a it was a little bit of eyebrows raising, but it was at the same time that it wasn't just me who was entering the uh, the, the the commercial side. At the same time that Francis Cook was entering, Dave Fabry, um, Tim Trine, um, and and other people, uh, Laurel Christensen eventually came on board. People like that who all saw that there was a lot of value that you could bring um, if you're a researcher and a clinician into a field and into uh, a manufacturing field that needs to understand more about the patients they're serving. So, um, so you, can, you can work in, in companies, I've been fortunate to work at two companies that have excellent, excellent technical staff. Yes. But they can build something, but knowing what to build and more importantly, how to apply it and how to get the most out of it you have to understand who you're building for, and, of and the the real understanding of what sensory neural hearing loss is like, uh, and especially once you start combining it with the potential for cognitive decline in some older individuals, then the the picture of what a hearing aid is, meaning what is it fundamentally doing for a person, uh, what does it need to do, becomes much more complex. And, um, and much and more important, I mean, right? Not just let's make something that that makes everything louder. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and one of the areas, for example, that I'm very aware of, very sensitive to is just the, the, the inherent variability from patient to patient, even in simple things like, um, you know, kind of, kind of core psychoacoustic abilities like frequency resolution and temporal resolution. Then when you start talking about the cognitive processing side of things, there's so much variability in how any individual will perceive sound. And one of my mantras and being, being in the field for as long as I have, I allow myself to have mantras. So (laughs) that's okay. You're allowed to (laughs) learn some of my mantras. And one of my, one of my mantras, it's not unique is that the only person who knows how sound sounds is the person who is experiencing it. You know, you can't, you can, you can make as many measurements as you want to, to predict certain aspects of the way sound passes through the perceptual system. But at the end of the day, the way a person actually perceives things, once you flavor in their perceptual preferences, which is a big part, kind of an untapped area that people who fit hearing aids deal with every day, but it's not very well described. People just want sound to sound differently. Not only do they perceive it differently, but they have preferences. And that whole clinical process becomes very fascinating to me. How How do you get the most out of the perceptual system that the person brings to you? Because we can't change that, you know, at this point in time, we can't, we can't, well, question, you know, cognitive processing is one area where, yes, you probably, we can, but in terms of the core way in which the auditory system, peripheral auditory system processes sound, if you're working in the hearing field, you don't get to play with that, you know, the implant people can, you know, good for them. We can't play with that on the hearing aid right. side. So right. we have right. to, we have to live with what the patient brings us in terms of a perceptual system. So, and so it, how do you, I guess, what, it, what is the answer to that? Because right, there are some people that will, will swing to one side of the pendulum and say, I have to verify 
the the bleep out of this hearing aid using equipment and then my patient has to adapt to it because it's set the right way and mm-hmm. then there's the other end where it's completely perception based how does that sound without any real quantitative metric how do you kind of bring those two together to get the best of both worlds it, it is it is a combination of the two um but i think one of the fundamental things that people do every day, but don't really think about is that there are two phases to fitting a hearing aid. There is the prescriptive phase where based on an audiometric uh, measure, primarily just thresholds these days, that you make predictions about what the, you know, what what a a theoretically the best frequency response should be for a patient and and gaining compression values. Right. Um, And then you enter into a subjective phase in which soon as you, for example, soon as you say, how does that sound? And, you know, does it sound right for you? Whatever you, whatever you did on the prescriptive phase, and let's say you did a prescriptive phase and you verified it with a real ear and it's, it looks like a perfect response. As soon as you ask the patient's opinion and you respond to that, all those prescriptive steps are kind of right. off the table now because yeah. that was a good place to start. Great. But now you're going into the subjective phase. And I, you, you see some clinicians struggle with that. It's like, yeah, the patient wants more of this, but, but my, my real ear machine says I shouldn't <laughs> do that. You know? And so you get in that trap and it's like the only person, you know, then I bring up a mantra, the only person who knows what sound sounds like is the person who's perceiving it. And it's, it's like, it's not a matter of not trusting the patient. It's, of course. it's creating, creating clinical approaches that do a better and better job of trying to capture what the patient's saying. And one of the things that I remind people is, is, is that 90 X percent of hearing aids that are fit these days on patients are fit with a volume control. And to me, that that's the, that's a clear indication that you're handing subjective adjustments over to the patient, even if it's simple as a volume control. So you can play with your, not play, you can work really hard to <laughs> hit okay. your, your targets as much as you want to. As soon as you give the patient a hearing aid with a volume control and they decide to turn it up or down, it's like, okay, you know, it's a diff- now you're in a different world or a different phase. And instead of fighting against that, it's like, okay, now the patient's telling me something about their hearing that wasn't predicted by the fitting rationale, meaning that their loudness response is different than the median, for example. So a right. fitting rationale, for example, nearly all fitting rationals like now in a one or most of the industry proprietary ones, they are based on some estimate of loudness perception. Yes. Meaning that, and they predict it based off a threshold, but those are median predictions. And there's a lot of variability in that. that so, average, right? It's, it's an average. It's, yeah. it's, it's what, what we have magically come up with to help the average person with, you know, the average fitting, the average hearing loss, all these things are average. They have to be, customized at the end of the day right and 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 so and, and and so it is and so it's 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 the to me the job of a good clinician is to say okay what do i what am i learning about the person's auditory system now and what does that mean for as i move forward you know with that patient um and and one of the things that i in, i i spent 22 years 23 years when i was with Otacon doing summer camps, you know, mm-hmm. with students. and so we had a lot of time teaching summer uh, students there. Right. Had a certain amount of time that I would visit to universities. Uh, and that was mostly my colleagues who were doing that, but I would do some of the visits. And one of the things I tried to emphasize, especially with the young audiologists, was that when, um, when you're fitting a hearing aid, you, you've, you don't change your auditory system. It is what it is. Your job is to understand that auditory system and try to get the most out of that. And the, adapt and, the hearing uh, aid to the auditory system. Yeah. And I'll tell you that, you know, the, the, the analogy that I would use all the time uh, was, was like fitting a peg leg, right? The player goes out to sea, loses half the leg. How do you, you know, I'd ask students, how do you fit a peg leg? Well, you measure the other leg and you figure out how much you lost and you cut a piece of wood that length, <laughs> you know? And I said, is that how modern prosthetic devices are fit? No, they're, you know, they're very much into the remaining muscle, uh, bone, bone and, um, muscular, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, 
structure that the person has left, even the neural intervention that the patient has left, and it, it mates with that. I said, yes. Now, how do we fit a hearing aid? What do we measure? We measure thresholds. What are thresholds? Right. How much of the leg the white whale bit off? You know, you know, and and it's it's like we can't get that back. We yeah. we have something to work with. So well, how I, we I think I'm pretty sure you would agree, right? That I mean. <laughs> maybe it's not the best analogy, but I kind of feel like the audiogram, the threshold, we're getting close to that being that peg leg of just cut a piece of wood and put it there. We're getting such limited information. Well, well yeah, that, that's, that, that, yeah, that's the point of the analogy is that, you know, it, you, you have to have the peg leg right or the, or the pirate's going to tilt one way or the other. So you got to get the length right. So I have no problem with getting the length right, but don't, don't pretend like you know everything about how that body is going to need to move that leg or whatever. And right. so, and so what I've always tried to encourage with young audiologists is to think about what is left, you know, what, is, how does that system that's left work? What am I learning about? What am I learning about as loudness perception? What am I learning about as resolution? Things like that. And I'm not, and I've never really, you know, put a lot of emphasis on trying to bring more, you know, you know, psychoacoustic testing into the hearing aid clinic, uh, just because for practical reasons, it never felt that it was going to go well, you know, so that was probably the better way to do things. But even at a baseline, someone just working in a regular clinical environment, regular private practice environment, fitting hearing aids every day, you should always, in my mind, you should always be thinking about what, what do I know about that person's auditory system? And within the range of controls I have and the devices I'm right. fitting, what can I do to get the most out of their auditory system with the tools that I have? Well, and I think I think that that I'm sure, right? I think that that leads into what do we know and what tests can we really do to uncover that, right? Because threshold is limiting in, in terms of whether it be autoacoustic emissions, you know, doing a full cochlear assessment, cognitive assessment, where are you in terms of, you know, opening up the, the vault of the tests that we should be doing on patients? The, the, the problem, the, the problem, let's talk about the periphery first. All so right. the problem with the periphery is that there's so many different dimensions that could potentially be, be off in the peripheral auditory system, you know, right. frequency resolution, temporal resolution, you know, a lot of different ways and a lot of different ways to, to measure it. Um, that I'm not sure that that would, would it, it was ever going to be clinically reasonable to be able to measure that. And I know that's, that, that some work is being done on thing uh, on, on different, the next level of psychoacoustic testing, you know, so yeah. maybe, and hopefully we'll see that. Hopefully we'll see that, but no one ever, paid enough attention to really push that forward. Sure. Um, there have been some attempts like the TENS uh, test was an attempt to, to better understand the functionality of the remaining auditory system. So that was very much in line with this idea of understanding it. Um, but that never really took off, you know, from, from that standpoint. So that's a little bit of a, of a kind of like a, a warning sign, a warning example of, yeah. you, know, you, you know, whatever. Um, um, so that's one thing. Now, on the karma side, I think it's different because because I think because patients don't typical patients don't link their their hearing with their cognitive health, right? And so even testing it, you know, whether even you know simplest cognitive screeners or or whatever, and there's a variety of different tools. You well know, you know, yeah. the range of, of the sort of tools. And I don't have a strong opinion about which tool to be using. It's just the process. I just say use a tool. I don't really care which tool you use, but do something. <laughs> yeah, do something because it raises the awareness of the patient. Exactly. That, oh, this is linked together. This is something. And then that can open up the discussion of, of the, the amount of research that's accumulating every month about untreated hearing loss and the cognitive uh, risk of untreated hearing loss and the potential for improving, uh, you know, core cognitive, uh, at least perceptual processing in some, yeah. whatever exactly what it is, you know, and, and, you know, there's theoretical debates about what you're actually changing, if anything, and, and everything, but just, just increasing the awareness of the patient of the potential risk and, and the potential linkage, then they take their hearing loss more seriously. Yes. And, and um, when I was, when I was a young, when I was younger, you know, a long time ago, um, 
it, cancer was the scary thing, right? Because it was, it was back where, you know, more and more cancers are being discovered and the treatment and, and we're, we're, you know, and, and it's a very serious issue. And so it was a very scary thing to talk about with people because the, the, there was just so much, there's such a limit to the knowledge that was known. Right. To me, cognitive decline is the new cancer yeah. in the standpoint that that doesn't mean cancer has gone away. Cancer still terrible. No, no, no. But it is something that's more readily talked about. Daughters, doc, daughters, doctors are more willing and, and ready to diagnose it because they've got a treatment plan as compared right. to data out there indicating that, you know, there are a lot of doctors that that know their patients have cognitive decline, have signs of dementia. And they're not saying anything for fear of nothing we can do. Yeah, well, exactly. There, and, and so people are know that there's something going on. They've witnessed it in generation or, you know, above them or beyond that. Um, you know, but but they're they're concerned. What do I do? I don't want to be that person. I don't want to live outlive my body. So the aging baby boomers, right? One of the things we know about the aging baby boomers is that they're healthier than the previous oh, year because of of, you know, kind of typically better, better lifestyles, more focused on, on good health and smoking reductions and exercise and all that sort of stuff that, you know, that the, ex the life expectancy should go up, but they don't want to outlive their brains. In other words, you know, they know that their, their body could be physically better, but they've witnessed cognitive decline in, in perhaps their parents and uncle, grandparent or something. And that's, that's a scary proposition. Nobody wants to be that, be in that position, you know, to, to, to be there. And so they're concerned about that. So just that, but that doesn't mean that they link it to untreated hearing loss. And I think well, no, they, they the don't, they, they definitely don't. We don't do a great job at putting out those links and those correlations. And I love what you said, which is if we start doing something a little bit more qualitatively, quantitatively in the clinics, well, then we can raise the awareness of it because you're right. I, I, I always use the joke of, you know, my grandmother sat around, it's not a joke, actually, my grandmother sat around in a house dress and didn't do much. She didn't have an active lifestyle. My mother's in her mid-70s and she's way cooler than I am and <laughs> does way more things than I do, right? I mean, it's just a, it's a different age and you're right. They want to they wanna cherish every one of those years, whether it be till 80 or 90, and, and they want to make the most of it, not be a vegetable. Right. It, it's the whole second life issue. You know, the idea that, OK, I'm working, you know, I'm building a career, getting my kids through college, you know, doing all that kind of stuff. Now it's my time. You know, yeah. that, that whole generational shift in that attitude of like, you know, no, I don't want to take resources from the herd. So I'm going to wander off sort of thing. You know, that, you know, that old, you know, previous generation sort of viewpoint on things. That's not what we're seeing. And, and so being both physically healthy and cognitively healthy is something that's really on people's minds. And I think one of the best things that audiologists can do is to not be afraid to bring up the topic. Um, and even doing assessments, you know, are just a good way of just in increasing the awareness about the linkage between, um, you know, untreated hearing loss and, and the effects on cognitive decline, whatever it is, I tend to, you know, be a proponent of the, uh, of the lack of stimulation, you know, uh, kind of explanation, but I know that there's other explanations. I, I'm just, you know, I don't think it really matters what the explanation is. How, how about, yes, I think we can both agree on that, that I, I, whatever theory and whichever one will pan out, I look forward to. Right. But yeah. and, and right now today, on, you know, here's but, what we know that, you know, the Lancet has put out that treating hearing loss is perhaps the single most modifiable factor mm -hmm. for reducing that risk. And, and if we know this, if this information is published, is readily available, it is our job to provide that education. Yeah. And, and it, absolutely. And it's, it's like, you know, whatever the science ends up, you know, expanding our understanding of it, all paths still lead to the fact that you got to use your hearing. You got to use your yeah, brain. Exactly. You got to stimulate it. One of the best ways you can stimulate it is to go to a party, go to a restaurant, you know, challenge yourself, engage with other people, you know, have that pleasurable experience, get out there, stop retreating from life, you know, keep getting yourself out in, 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 in the world that always used to be enjoyable to you. Uh, it's more than just a loss of opportunity that we always kind of thought untreated hearing loss was, is that people just don't get as or much the, or, or God forbid the, the lifestyle charts, right? right. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, so let me, let me ask you then. So now you're on 
Now that now that I've learned a little bit of your why and your backstory, I think it's fair to say you're on your fifth career uh, in terms of being in hearing, all within hearing healthcare. Uh, what is that transition been like going from, uh, dare I say, mainstream hearing aid manufacturer? And I love what you did, which was, you know, we've got these really smart widget makers, but I need to bring the research, the knowledge, the clinical expertise so that they can understand the impact that they can really have. And we can bring it together to, to better our patients' lives. So that yeah. that's awesome. And I understand because I've been maybe a little bit of shunned leaving research and now coming more into private practice, although I still teach at the university. But what is it like now going to you know the, the next stage of your career? What has that been like at Whisper? And, and what is the future that Don sees for hearing healthcare? Um, yeah, I, 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 I made the switch uh, from, from Oticon to Whisper um, early in 2021. Um, because I wanted, I wanted to get back kind of to the roots of, of, of what being in the hearing aid industry was like. So when I, okay. when I joined Oticon back in the mid nineties, um, that was right at the advent of digital hearing aids. So it was mm-hmm. a really exciting time and it, it felt like a much smaller company because it was a much smaller company. It was just, you know, it's just a traditional hearing aid company from the sure. standpoint of we build products and we work through the, you know, professionals to get those out there. And that was kind of the sum total of our business. And over the over the next 25 years, it just became a much more complicated business with you know with with all you know different players involved and things like that. And I just found myself kind of getting further and further away from from the core things that made, were most interesting to me, which okay. was is was to to be part of that that circle of who's working on products, what are we trying to accomplish, things like that. I just I just was being just moving further away from it just because of, of my time in the company. And so when I had the opportunity to join Whisper, it was to get back to that sort of much more early stage, really exciting, cutting edge sort of stuff. So now I'm just much more in direct contact and directly involved in discussions about what are we building and why are we building it and okay. what are we going to get the most out of it. So um, I end which up- is, Which is, look, is, I, I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I'm always- a fan of just having a, a very open and frank conversation. And, and I know I'm not the first person to bring this to your attention, but it's it 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 could look like going from a major hearing aid manufacturer to now, uh, I don't know, is, is Whisper the, is it the startup? Is it the over the counter, right? I mean, there's all these rumblings out there when in, in, in reality, there's true, truly good intentions of continuing to bring forth the greatest hearing healthcare possible. Yeah, and Whisper is not an OTC company. We, right. we work through the professional channel. We have since uh, we've been in the marketplace. How, how about this, Don? What is a what is an over the counter company, and what isn't? Because I'm not sure I could define that. And and you seem to have and, a clear and, you, and you won't be able to going forward. Okay. All right. Okay. Fair. Okay. That, you know, that's what I thought. <laughs> even the mainline companies have, have been showing signs that they are moving in that direction with yes. with their with the, some of the purchases and things like that. And I think the world. I think the world is it's too. It's a little bit overly, a lot of people just want to say, well, you can either be over the counter or, you know, traditional model. Yeah. And it's like, well, probably not because consumers don't fall into those easy buckets either. You know, consumers, there's more and more consumers every day who are looking for healthcare. Uh, frankly, uh, I look at it, if I'm, if I'm going to put consumers in a bucket, there's less than 20% that treat their hearing loss and more than 80 that don't. Those are the two mm-hmm. buckets I care about, right? Yeah. Yeah. And and exactly. And, and so the, the idea that I think it's, 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 it's incumbent upon the, the con- professionals in the field to realize that patients are going to come into the process with different expectations and, and have different preferences about how they want to get service. Some are going to be very bottom line price. I don't want to have to deal with anybody. I just want to do something, get my family off my back, whatever, Yeah. you know, you know, that's one extreme. There's someone who's the other extreme is someone who's on their fourth set of hearing aids with the same practitioner they've worked at with for 20 years, and they're very happy to get professional care that way and things like that. But then there's there's variations along the way. And so I think every hearing aid company has is in the process of at least considering what their models are going to be um, and and finding that that there are different ways you can get to consumers, uh, you know, following different paths. Um, Whisper is is very much 
uh, invested in the idea of using the most advanced concepts in AI, uh, machine learning, okay. to bring solutions to patients. So by definition, we can't be a cheap hearing aid company because that that development cost is just not something that a company, a small company that's full of high-end engineering talent in the world of AI is not the sort of company that, you know, is designed to mass produce low-end products to get out there. So that's, that's just not our, you know, that just doesn't make sense for this company. Um, and the other thing is that we understand, one of the reasons I'm in the company and one of the things I do in the company is I'm the voice of, okay, what does it take to get the most out of a person's auditory system? What does it take to get the most out of the products? And so um, we very much believe- So you're the annoying guy who keeps saying to the engineers, it's not good enough. Yeah, well, and it's not so much that it's not good enough, but we have the opportunity to do this part, you know. And, and, to do and, more. Yeah. yeah. And um, and so, uh, and it's not just me, believe it. It's not just me and the company. Uh, no, I, I know. I'm <laughs> um, but the idea being that, that, we we need professionals to be to be involved in our process, and um, and we need we are really looking at patients who take their hearing loss seriously enough to recognize that they have to invest in it, you know, from a financial standpoint. Um, and so, exactly where we end up with in terms of you know how do we support our 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 current uh, HCP customers? You know, do we do we help them by doing more with their patients? Do we um, do we only use them as a traditional model and things like that? That's something that I think all companies are going through, just trying to decide sure. kind of sure. how, how they do that and where it goes. One of the things we are doing is, you know, we're, we are we 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 do a lot of research into the marketplace to understand the consumer. Uh, one right. one of, one of the very interesting things about working with a group of people out of Silicon Valley who've worked in other consumer products is they become very focused. They have a very strong kind of um, bias towards really understanding their the ultimate user of their product. And in the traditional hearing aid world, there's a focus on understanding what the professionals are asking for. And we do that, of course. But we also have a very strong program into understanding what the end users want, understanding how they want to get care, how much of their care that they want to get remotely, how much care do they want to get in person, what differentiates those two type of people, you know, who wants where who wants convenience but still expects professional care versus who, you know, they want all their care professionally face to face, and understanding that space to understand how we can how we can be in, in that space effectively to to bring whisper to as many people as we can. So how do you so how do you do that? How do you use or utilize advances in artificial intelligence and AI technology to do all of that? To really well, to meet the customer where they are, to make sure that they have the best hearing health care, to make sure that they go through the right diagnostic process. How do you bring that all together? Well, it is the our focus on AI, and it's not our only use of AI, but our focus on AI is on creating a, a better solution, speech and noise solution. So that's, okay. that's really what our a machine learning team is. Okay. The experts in there are really focused on to do that. We also have we also have um, some industry veterans on just general digital signal processing, also because we do build hearing aids and they have to do more than just do noise reduction. You know, they have to do all the other things that hearing aids do, and so we have that team right. in place also. Um, so our use of AI right now is very much focused on there, but we have expertise who who have used AI to solve a lot of different problems. You know, and so. Yeah. And so, um, but we haven't really branched out into using AI and other things other okay. than that because we're very focused on solving that problem. But like I said, because because a lot of the the individuals in our company have experience in other consumer electronic products and 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 kind of high tech sort of approaches in the marketplace, we have a lot of people with with that sort of orientation. So you know and. And a lot and those people come from outside the industry, so they kind of have a fresh set of eyes on it. So those of us in the company from inside the industry, you know, you know, we'll have a perspective and, a, and a, an attitude. I try really hard not to be. Well, back in the day, we did it. This way. <laughs> you know how, how, how annoying that is, you know, to, to do that. 
you know, um, so it's a matter of, you know, okay, okay, you know, that's a great idea. One thing you should know about is that, you know, one of the things I try to emphasize, for example, that comes up in conversation so much is what the journey to making the decision to do something about amplification is all about for a patient. Right. That it's not just a logical sort of, oh, I have a problem. I'm going to get a device to solve the problem. It, you know, you know, it's it's a it's a long journey, you know, for many people. Uh, not, what, seven to 10 year journey, right? Seven to 10 year on average, but then there's a lot of variation. And so someone who's acting right away has a different mindset than someone who's waiting a long period of time. And we you know, can't what, just keep picking the low hanging fruit, the 20%. Yeah. We're just, we're not doing our job. Yeah. Right. And so, so part of understanding how to reach out and extend our reach as a company um, is, is a combination of, of kind of having this consumer oriented viewpoint, but also understanding. Yeah. But there's been, the, the the history is strewn with 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 dead companies who thought that they could make a lot of money really quickly because because there's a lot of untreated people with hearing loss without sure. understanding why there's so many untreated exactly untreated hearing exactly. loss you know what keeps them from work moving forward and understanding the user and understanding how you get there it's not just like you you build a new widget and then people are going to come you know they're still struggling with all the emotional reactions that some of these individuals have about, about getting older and, and dealing with the inevitable consequences, which one of the big ones is here. We've, on. we've, we've always, we've basically whittled all of those patient concerns into like one word, fear, right? Whether it be fear of the unknown, fear of getting older, fear of, you know, buying something that doesn't work, fear of dementia, it's all rooted in fear. So how do we break through that. And so what it, what is Whisper's approach to break through that in a new market in a in an untraditional way? Well, we know that there's a limit to what you can do from a marketing standpoint only to break through that level. Because if if you if you view it only as a marketing challenge, then um, what ends up happening is is you kind of start to gravitate back to the same place of, you know, lifestyle pictures, you know, pictures of healthy, active older people, you know, and, and all the sort of things that have been used traditionally for a number of years. <laughs> and it's, it's like, okay, but that you're not really necessarily tapping into that mental process that they're going through, you know? And to me, that's a very difficult thing to solve with marketing alone. You know, right. you can make some inroads. Um, yes. And, uh, but that's a hard one to do that one. So, so that's why one of the most important things that we think uh, is necessary to, 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 um, to move that consumer along the path is to have professionals involved because they recognize that. And if they're good at their, what they do, uh, which most are, um, they understand that path and understand how to keep the patient moving forward. Which so, is why I think, I think earlier when you said, uh, you know, we're not OTC and we joked about, well, what is the definition nowadays? I think that's really what is separating out Whisper is that it's it's not a widget you buy on a store shelf. It's, I mean, telehealth. I mean, is that really, is that the category you'd put yourself in? Well, it, it, it's one of the, one of the things that we think is part of the future. Absolutely. We do Absolutely. think that, 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 that patients post COVID, um, they recognize that there's a lot of convenience in receiving, you know, healthcare via telemedicine to whatever degree that you can do it and do it in a legitimate way. Yes. And so, you know, that's, that's, that's an indication of the idea that let's, let's not do an inside out analysis of how do we want to structure our business? Let's do an outside in analysis. How does the, how does the person who's going to be paying us money, you know, ex want to get their devices and to get their care? And so um, a, a lot of those patients want to go through a live, um, a live approach with their, with their audiologist like they always have done. Sure. And we want to be there and offer our product as a good alternative premium quality, premium level device for them. So you but see, so Whisper, you see Whisper being in the audiologist practice as yes, being I, right it, there it, on the shelf with the other five or six major. Yeah, we believe, we believe that we are going to, to um, 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 just 
just work ourselves into being one of those awesome. top shelf offerings that people have. Um, and, and so the, uh, and, and the HCPs who work with us, um, you know, and we have it, we're still building our network of HCPs. Of course, of course. Long process, but that's, that's where they present this, you know, they, they present this as a, a good alternative premium device to some of the traditional devices. We have two things working in our favor very strongly. One is the AI basis, yep. uh, very strong leaning into the AI basis. And the other thing that we have working strongly in our favor is the idea of it is a, we, we conceive of the product as a software-based product where we can do upgrades to the sound processing over time. And that is something that we very much lean into. So, so our first product. So are you suggesting, product, I just, I want to, or do you mean a, a one and done type purchase? No, 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 no. What I'm, what I'm saying is that okay. when a person, when a person, uh, we actually, most of our products go out on lease instead of purchase, but okay. they, we do have some options where patients can purchase if they want to own something or if their insurance company expects them to own. So you, I'm sorry. I just couldn't use that lease, right? Right. Right. Yeah, that uh, which which by the way, I, I mean, we could go down a whole other rabbit hole. I believe in, I, I don't like the word lease, um, but I know for legal reasons we use it. But I really do love the subscription membership right. Right. and how lease makes that possible. I believe right. that is yeah. wholeheartedly the future of hearing healthcare. And but what it is really a very strong distinguishing feature in in our product is that. So we released our first product back in October of 2020. Right. Since then, we've had four upgrades to the sound processor. And so those upgrades can, can be the machine learning solution that we use. It can be the compression system that we use. It can be the feedback system we use. Whatever about the product that our experts feel that they can improve have gone out as part of these four updates. So basically, if a, per, if a patient purchased a whisper system in October of 2020, when they first came out, they're now on their fifth generation That's cool. of sound processing. In, That's in cool. the, and that is fundamental to the way that the product was developed was that it is a software-based product, like a, like a smartphone is, you know, or something else like that, where the, the value of it comes both from having excellent hardware but also from being able to update the software. I and love, I love your cell phone analogy because now it makes more sense to me. So yes, there are software upgrades that continue to make the device better. But I think when you said no before to the one-time purchase, at some point that hardware is limited. And so right. there and, will and, and, be the next generation of, of Whisper hardware that has regular software updates, which I think is important for people to understand out front, right? Because too many patients think, oh, I, I buy a hearing aid and I'm all set. That's not the way it works. Yeah. And 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 so so one of the reasons why the subscription model was something we we're interested in using also was the fact that to put emphasis on it really is a lot about the software that you put on the product. And so having you know being left over with a set of old hearing aids, you know, they're there, but but they're old, you know, they're, they're <laughs> out of date. Yeah, yeah. And, and to say that in a sense, we're on a fifth generation of software in our product right now in just a little over a year yeah. indicates that, that this really is a concept. Other companies will do kind of updates to their operating system on the hearing aid, uh, but it's usually either a bug fix or it's because Apple has changed their operating system and they yeah. need to update. It's, it's it. not what you're talking about, which yeah. is a, a fundamental okay, we change. Have a new noise reduction solution. Yeah. We've tweaked some of the parameters in our machine learning parameters. We've um, we've improved our feedback cancellation system. Whatever we've done, and we've done different things and different updates. That's what we lean into. And the other thing that a company has to do in order to do that is to have the personnel available to do that. Of in other course. words. If you, if you put all your emphasis on the maximizing the performance of a product when it comes out, which you should do, and then that group of people now are looking four years down the road to the next generation of high-end products, then to say, oh, by the way, we need to do this, and we need to do this, and this traditional hearing aid companies are just not structured that way in terms of investing into the idea of upgrades. We are totally invested in the idea of upgrades. We, we leave capacity in the devices, both battery capacity Awesome. And sound processing capacity because we know we're going to be adding things to it. 
And then we yeah. had the staff available to do that because that is, that's a fundamental part of what we believe will set this product apart at the premier level. Is it, that- it sounds like if I had to make an analogy, it's the, uh, the Tesla of hearing aids is what it sounds like. Well, yeah, we try not to get too heavily into Silicon Valley. Um, <laughs> okay, fair, uh, fair. We are <laughs> That's not Valley. what I meant by the analogy, but I can I can yeah, see how it, it could be taken that way. Well, well, well no, but it, it's it's like you know, it's but but leaning into like the cell phone analogy that consumers can recognize, even smart TVs these days, where you can put yeah. on different apps for your different streaming and, and yeah that. but smart tvs make us all feel dumb because we don't know how to turn them on we don't know how to get to certain yeah. apps so yeah. <laughs> that would be my only issue there look don i uh, i have taken way more of your time uh, than i promised you i would i have learned a ton today i know the listeners out there we've got uh, uh hundreds thousands of of hearing healthcare providers who i know they know Don Shum. They know now they'll know more about his story about Whisper. So I am forever appreciative that you came on here and took the time. I I, I need to know something personal about you, though, which is you said something about moving recently. So, mm-hmm. so where did you move to or from? What's going on? I, I live in the Boston suburbs and I moved from one suburb to another. Uh, oh. just, it was just- I'm, out, I'm in Sterling. I know I'm, 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 uh, I've just recently moved into Norfolk. Uh, you know, we found Okay. A nice- well then that, ju- uh, well, I didn't, I had no idea where you were in this country. That means at some point I'm going to have to bug you and we're going to go have to go out and share a beer. If, if, yeah, if that's your we'll thing, have to, we'll have to do that. Yeah. Yeah. All no, right. We found a nice little, a nice little piece of, uh, of property out there. And it's like, no, this is, this is a really peaceful place to, 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 be into home. So. Well, des- well, I, I, you're well deserving of it, Don. Thank you so much for for all you continue to do to really strive towards excellence in audiology, and and thank you for everything. So I appreciate your time. Take care, Don. Thank you, Keith. Thanks, thanks for the opportunity.